The artist, however faithful to his personal vision of reality, becomes the last champion of the individual mind and sensibility against an intrusive society and an officious state. The great artist is thus a solitary figure. He has, as Frost said, a lover's quarrel with the world. In pursuing his perceptions of reality, he must often sail against the current of his time. This is not a popular role. If Robert Frost was much honored during his lifetime, it was because a good many preferred to ignore his darker truths. I had a lover's quarrel with the world. That's me. I thought of modifying that to say I had my lover's quarrels, plural, with the world. But I make that one sustained quarrel all my life. <laughs> lover's quarrel, it's a long sustained quarrel. I knew Mr. Frost uh, quite late in his life, really the last four or five years. And I was impressed uh, by a good many qualities, but also by his uh, toughness. He was not particularly belligerent in his relations, his human relations, but he felt it very strongly that the United States should be a country of power, of force, to use that power and force wisely. But uh, he once said to me not to let the uh, Harvard in me get uh, to be too important. So we've, uh, we've uh, followed that advice. You never know what I'll do next. It's time I stopped, you know. It's time this should I be quieted down. This public life I've got into is, is more or less an accident. I never set out to do it. I got I got fifty dollars for doing it once first, you know, and I got called out into it and I needed the living and I nearly died uh, doing it, but I conquered it sort of. But there's still there are reserves, things I don't wear on my sleeve. Acknowledging the introduction of his host, the new president of Sarah Lawrence College, Mr. Frost is reminded of his old friend and contemporary, Vachel Lindsay. I, I was as happy about Vachel as we jealous poets, artists can be, you know. <laughs> we, he was one I could be happy about. Some I. Some I tr I'm afraid I'm too jealous of, but I really don't like them, you know. <laughs> I strive to get over dislike and all that, but it doesn't come out very well. And I'm always glad when one I don't like very honestly that I've been tried to, I'd like, when he gets mad at me so I don't have to read him anymore. <laughs> and have to strive with him. It's a funny world. But Vachel was one of these very disarming people, a very good boy, and one of the, ki the real kind of genius, call it, call it, a, you could say there was a little strange about him. He was a little touched, you know, but you could call it divinely touched, you know. He had something very fine about him, lofty, and uh, did some very crazy things. He knew how to do them without trying. <laughs> uh, he didn't, uh, there was, he was, some of these poets seemed to me to get in the corner, you know, gnaw their fingernails and try to get a dark corner, you know, and try to go crazy so they'd qualify, qualify. <laughs> and there's none of that in Rachel. He was crazy in his own right. <laughs> Uh, some of the strangest things. 
I ought to tell you what you're seeing here on the side, this sideshow. <laughs> this, this is a documentary film going on. Uh, and this, they've been in two or three of them for government purpose, and they, they've all been about me with a hoe digging potatoes or walking in the woods reciting my own poems, which I... <laughs> I don't, I don't farm very much for a good many years. Little, I have a little garden. But it's a false picture that represents me as always digging potatoes or saying my own poems in the woods. You know, this time we're going to have it right. We're going to have a case <coughs> like this where I'm at, with my crowd. Going to have the crowd in it and some other things. They were, they were with me today on shipboard on the Essex, the old carrier, you know. And I was with the commander, and uh, the old subject came up of peace and wars. That's that category. And I had to have another think at it. And another, that always means another say to it. And I said to him, peace is something that you only get by war or the threat of war, however tacit the threat. And he nodded grimly. And that's something that we all want the peace, and we are thinking about it. Anything like that that bothers me all the time, something comes up and I say a new one to it. It appeases me for the moment. That I'd had a fresh think, the occasion, the occasion had given me a fresh think. And there's usually an occasion. I don't know, meeting somebody or reading something in the paper, or hearing something about the world, or, it's all just, just this one thing, a think. And, and the ex excitement you get out of having, having a think that you want to sh pass to other people. No. And sometimes, as I say, when it's too much for me and I can't say anything to it, I say, me for the woods. <laughs> That's one of my oldest sayings. It doesn't matter what it is, family troubles, any kind. I say, me for the woods. This is a regular spring thing to get here and see what's lived through the winter. It took a long time to be a Vermonter. I came here in 20. See how many years ago that is. And for years I wasn't uh, called a Vermonter. They'd have meetings and things about poetry, but they, they considered me an outsider. Then this last year, they made me poet of Vermont. Oh, the little town of Ripton, up near the mountaintop, where city folks come and go and for a short time stop to view the mountain scenery and breathe the mountain air and wonder at us simple folks who get our living there. It is Robert Frost, the poet, put Ripton on the map while others we are proud to know, he is our leading champ. For others our esteem may go, none shall go above him. For he loves man and nature so, that is why we love him. Do you like his poetry? Yes, I like it very well. And, um, I think he's one of the most famous in Vermont. I think perhaps with Sandberg, he's one of the truly great American poets that we have, at any rate in my opinion. Mr. Kennedy's. <laughs> what is your favorite Frost poem? I think I like uh, Birches. 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 <laughs> Which of Robert Frost's poems is your favorite? Who? Robert Frost. Funny world, isn't it? Where you came from is of very great importance, you know, your family ways. I was brought up and started life in San Francisco. My father was chairman of the Democratic City Committee. 
when Cleveland was elected. I never went to school till I was about 12 years old. And I wasn't very well. And, and I went downtown with my father all the time, had all my noon meals in the big headquarters of the Democratic Party saloon, Abe Levy's saloon. And I was sort of political kid round. I, I came each. My mother would leave us at, at Omaha and at Chicago to recheck my father's coffin. My, me and my sister, I was 12 years old. And I carried other people around that couldn't stand up, and they were so grieved. So that, I guess that's the hard part of life. And I did everything I had to do to get by, money, little bit, you know, working at this and that. I worked on newspapers a little. It didn't do very well. I wasn't a very good reporter. I was too shy. I gravitated to the editorial page. <laughs> and we had a farm where I could partly earn a living. Didn't do it very well. and. I never was away from the farm an evening. More than three years, I think it was. Probably it was. I think once I came home, it was late as 8 o'clock. We never went to church. We never went to movies. Never went to anything. And there was nothing we were missing. We were having a very nice time. Nice little farm. And children. They had orchards and fruit and, and horse and cow and, and all that. I only left it, drifted away from it, for part-time teaching because I wasn't quite earning a living. And I think it came natural to do it. My mother was a teacher, and I drifted into it for bread and butter and began teaching a little district school and things. This we sold 12 children. I remember I had one and, and coming and going barefooted, coming and going to my knee, you know. <coughs> I never got called a poet till I was 40 or so, and I always thought it was a praise word that I couldn't use on myself. It's a praise word. You can write poetry, and I wrote it. I don't know how I did it and what would have happened if it hadn't come through somewhere in the end. My complete works are in my are with me here. Two books, a little new book and the low book. And they're about I think it adds up to about seven maybe 700 pages in 70 years, 10 pages a year, not, not many, but still at it always about the same a year. I, I don't calculate on it, but it turns out to be about that much a year, probably twice that and half thrown away. Uh, and people ask what poem you like best. The poem I like best is the one somebody's just praised or the one I've just written. <laughs> Or else I say you can't tell, you don't like to tell about your poems any more than the mother does about her children. When she has five or six children, she wouldn't tell you which is her favorite. She might have one. Maybe, maybe she shouldn't. She knows she shouldn't. <laughs> I said to an audience the other day, I just, how many of you don't know uh, stopping by woods? There was only one person in two or three thousand people raised his hand boy, shamelessly. <laughs> and, and then I, and a lady had just asked me to say it. And I said, what in the world do you want me to say it for when you all know it better than I do? You know, but I said it. <laughs> just out of lineage. Well, now I'm going to read to you. 
Now I out walking the world desert, and my shoe and my stocking do me no hurt. See, I've got to keep that little rhyming way all the way through it. <laughs> See, hurt, desert, stocking, walking, somewhere near. <laughs> now I out walking the world desert, and my shoe and my stocking do me no hurt. I leave behind good friends in town. Let them get well wined and go lie down. Don't think I leave for the outer dark like Adam and Eve put out of the park. Forget the myth. There's no one I am put out with or put out by. Unless I'm wrong, I but obey the urge of a song. I'm bound away, you know that song, and I may return if dissatisfied with what I learned from having died. You didn't know it was going to be a death poem. <laughs> and, but you see, what, what I want you to like to, is a double thing, isn't it? I like the little tight form and everything. Then I'm going to say to you, not as significant a poem as that, the last one I wrote, I sent it right in, fresh like that, without a title. I couldn't think of what to call it. See. In winter, in the woods, alone, against the trees I go. I mark a maple for my own and lay the maple low. At four o'clock, I shoulder axe, and in the afterglow, I link a line of shadowy tracks across the tinted snow. For winter, for nature, for nature I see no defeat in one tree's overthrow, or for myself in my retreat for yet another blow. That was the threat I was writing another, gonna write another book. <laughs> I didn't think of that when I wrote it, but I saw that afterwards, the same as the critics do. They always see meanings I didn't see when I wrote the book. But I put that in. Shall I say that twice to you? Because I, because I like like to have written it. It feels fr so fresh to me. You know, uh, in winter, in the woods alone, against the trees I go. I mark a maple for my own and lay the maple low. At four o'clock, I, I shoulder axe, and in the afterglow, I link a line of shadowy tracks across the tinted snow. I see for nature no defeat in one tree's overthrow, or for myself in my retreat for yet another blow. I brought with me tonight, or Mrs. Morrison has brought with me, 20, 30 copies of it to give, she's gonna give you each one, uh, carry away in my handwriting. I wrote it, wrote it this morning. I never know where I'll write or what I'll write. I, I remember once in Wils Wilkesboro, where I never was, but once in my life, Wilkesboro, Pennsylvania, stuck there, changing trains something. I had to go to a hotel, and I wrote one of my best poems right there in that hotel, standing on my head. <laughs> <laughs> There's a curious state of comes over you, that's all. But some people like to think it starts with a phrase or something. I think it starts with a mood. As Poe said somewhere, you know, he, he never, he wrote lots of prose and he had a hard life and died at 40, the poor boy. And, uh, but he said he never touched the poetry except when, you know, with something sacred touch. And, that's a strong word for it, but that feeling that you could never do it unless you never do it to pay a bill, because you probably won't. <laughs> <laughs> and yet it comes to market in the long run, you know, and you can't write it that way. If I ever thought when I was writing anything that this would settle, you know, pay the gas bill or something like that, I, I, I couldn't write it. But I do think in the middle of it, the only self-conscious thought I ever have is this seems to be going pretty good. <laughs> See, good luck, another step, you know. Still going. <laughs> Just like taking on thin ice, you know, where you might go through and fail, but it's still going. 
once I'm going, I either, I go the same as the, it goes, uh, I, I think it's like starting a sled at the top of the hill where they've worn the snow through too much, and it goes hard to start, but you get right over that gritty place, and a go she goes. You get right on and ride. One of the best ones I ever rode. And it? Uh, yeah, it's good fun. I had a little a bit of trouble with the last stanza to get that the way I wanted. But the first two were just slick, slick as grease. That's one of the happy accidents, you can call it. You know, that's what you go into a poem for. See that alone and that own and that go and that low. That I've kept glow and snow and overthrow and blow all the way through it. It's quite a feat. You don't make anything of the fact that retreat rhymes with defeat, then? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I value that on you. The, the, you can't really suspect me of just putting retreat there because of the rhyme. <laughs> uh, can you? Well, it's a hard question. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the way it ought to be. We, we retreat. We don't escape. That's a word I loathe, you know, escape. But retreat is sort of a sort of characteristic word to me, that you retreat for strength, you know. Church touches that, you know. They don't brought up in the right religion if they don't know what retreat is. You don't escape. You, you withdraw with God, with sleep. Uh, I often see as transported to a spot, you know. I'm there in the woods. Of the edge. I was there with the axe and the tree and everything. And I made it just like that. And with the whole, get, trying to get the whole feel of the whole, uh, you know, satisfying myself. I'd like to be there. See? I'm there. It's been some years since I felled a tree. But it's a pleasure to me. You know, I've often said that every poem solves something for me in, in life. I go so far as to say that every poem is a momentary stay against the, the confusion of the world. But of course, any psychiatrist will tell you that so is making a basket or making a horseshoe or giving anything form gives you a, a confidence in the universe that it has form, see? When you talk of, about...